<laughs> All right, it's seven o'clock. The Lord be with you. And, and also with you. with you. Let us pray. We thank you, Lord, for this, this night, and we ask you to guide us with your Holy Spirit into all truth, and we're so thankful that we're back together again. May you truly bless our time in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I'd like to start off by saying happy birthday, Ron. Hey, thank you. Oh, good. Hey. So nice to celebrate your birthday together tonight. <laughs> and uh, what a good and joyful and pleasant thing it is when brothers dwell together in unity, as Psalm 133 reminds us, and here we are. So as more and more of us come on, uh, we'll begin our study. You may remember where we left off. It's uh, John chapter 11. Lazarus is just about to be raised. So there's something symbolic in us coming back together tonight after all these weeks apart in the tomb in a way. And tonight the account continues. And I'd like George Stoll to please read for us John 11, 38 to 44. We'll start with that. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So we're good. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there's a bad odor, for he's been there four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Thank you, George. We will pause right there. And we're reminded that the name Lazarus is related to the Hebrew name Eleazar, which means the one whom God helps. And what a beautiful account we have of resurrection promise. We find ourselves somewhat late in the story as we jump into it tonight, but if we could remind ourselves what we've talked about and learned generally uh, in the weeks leading up to this to the account, what would we say? What are some things that you remember we talked about? The fact that Jesus waited four days before he went to see Lazarus. Yeah. yeah, and that uh, <clears throat> to wait that long meant he was truly, truly dead and unrevivable, unresuscitable. Yeah. <laughs> well, you said, I think, in your sermon on Sunday, Father Joe, something about after three days, they, they believe that the body separated from the, the spirit. Yes. Yeah. Which I didn't. I had no idea of that. Yep. I guess that's to show that he's really dead, and when he shows up on the fourth day, it's a major miracle, even mm -hmm. for the Jews who understood what was going on at the time. So. Yeah, that's true. Great. Any other comments or insights? <clears throat> okay. For this section here, beautiful that we're reading this tonight when it was assigned yesterday in the lectionary. So it's fresh in our minds and in our hearts. Now, George Stoll, I remember a so ago, you helped us understand the word which is translated here as deeply moved or uh, disturbed in the RSV. Can you yeah. remind us what that original word conveys? Yeah, it's a very interesting word. It's used twice here in John, and it's a, a deep movement in the heart. Um, it's a deep, heartfelt cry. And then I looked up in a couple other places. Um, in math, it's used six, five times in the New Testament. The same word is used 
when uh, Jesus healed a blind man in Matthew chapter 9, and he gave them strict instruction. So it was a, it was a deep instruction that he gave to the blind man not to tell anyone. Also, he applied the same word um, when the leper was healed. He gave him a stern warning. Um, and then, interestingly enough, it's used in Matthew, in Mark chapter 14, when the scribes grumbled against the religious, the, the scribes grumbled against the anointing of Jesus with perfume. It's the very same word that's used there. So a uh, little more digging needs to be done, but it's uh, basically here in this context, it's a deep heartfelt cry and it's not used very much. Thank you, George. So we know Jesus wept and he's deeply disturbed. What is he so disturbed about? And what was he weeping about? He was weeping about the, the death of Lazarus, who was his brother, his close friend. Yeah, yeah verse 36 says, see how he loved him. Yeah, it was also Martha and Mary, because um, when they wept and they were um, emotional is when he felt that emotion. So it was all three of them. Yeah, it, it, I get the feeling it's an empathetic uh, grief. He, he feels, he sees what sin has done in taking ultimately human life. And the end result of that whole, you know, man's rebellion and the consequences, and he sees the ultimate end of it. And I think that whole sense of it didn't have to be this way, it can't stay this way. And I think it was both grief and frustration that it came to such a terrible end. Mm. Mm. Father Joe? Yes. Can you hear me? Hi, Bill. Yes. Oh, okay. I just want to make sure that this thing is working. Oh. <laughs> yep. Welcome to the to the gang. Good evening. <laughs> hey, Bill. How are you guys? Hi. Dave Zinn, how many people are on right now? Do you know? 19. 19. All oh, right. Good. Great. Well, Lord, bring us more. <laughs> okay, so now we're in this section that George read, and thank you all for your wonderful comments. So Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Let's talk a little bit about the historical nature of what it meant to be buried in ancient Palestine. Um, what, what was it involving? Do you, do you know much about this? As I understand it, they were, when they were buried, they were put in a place until the, the flesh rotted away. And then they took the bones and put them in an ostuary or a, mm -hmm. a separate place. That's my understanding. Yes, I believe that a family would have a cave, something dug out of the limestone, and there would be a, a series of shelves which would hold the ossuaries. So after a year, they would come back and collect the bones and put it on the shelf. So it'd be like a family tomb. Mm -hmm. You might have someone being buried in there and it might be, say, the fifth or sixth person in your community or family, and the bones of all the others would be up on the shelf. So it'd be a very sacred place. Very common. Remember when our Lord died, he was buried in a tomb that was a gift to him from Joseph of Arimathea. He didn't have his own. They were not inexpensive. It was viewed as you know, part of the dignity of final existence and their care going forward. And burial was important. When a person died, they needed to be buried before sundown. So they took burial very seriously in that culture, as a lot of cultures do. And in this case, a stone would be laid across it. Take away the stone, he said, verse 39. Lord said, Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there's a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So that goes back to his dialogue with Martha, doesn't it? Yeah. When he calls her to faith, she says, I, I know that he will be <clears throat> raised on the last day. Yeah. 
but he's talking about something now, isn't he? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. Now remember Martha had said to Jesus, I know that God will do what you ask him to do. So she had that faith. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. So this gives us some insight into what Jesus is up to in his ministry among these people. It's to be a witness, isn't it? The ultimate sign of the seven signs in John's gospel. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. So what do you think the significance of that description in verse 43 is for us? Well, some, some have said it's a good thing he said Lazarus, otherwise every, everyone else who was here and there would have come out. <laughs> yeah. That's scary. You're scaring me here. <laughs> Could it also be to demonstrate that um, Jesus, in fact, didn't manhandle the body? Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Hmm. Other thoughts? Hmm. So his voice is a command. The word of God goes forth and does not return empty. Bible tells us that the Lord knows us each by name. There are a lot of parts to this that we could look at. Mm. But how beautiful. He calls them out by name and commands them to come out. Remember when Jesus called the storm, they said, who is this that even the wind and the storm obeys him? But Jesus is showing that he's Lord of nature, Lord of life, Lord of death, or death. The other, uh, can I say something real quick? I don't know if you hear me. Oh. It's also, to me, is that obviously this tomb probably was very dark, you know, black, very dark area. So coming out, it's almost like come from the darkness, come into the light. Because this was a daytime situation, I assume, not an evening. Uh, yes. I'll get it. <laughs> Hi, Joyce. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> I thought, but I, I also think that, that Jesus did that in a loud voice, standing out with the crowd, so they would take notice. Exactly. What's going on. You know, he didn't go into the tomb, as Lennon said, didn't, uh, you know, manhandle him or whatever. But he did it uh, in front of the crowd, so they would see that, you know, Jesus was the one that called him out and brought someone who was dead back to life. Yeah. And if you go back to, uh, what was it, uh, Verse 4, he speaks again, the whole purpose of this was for the glory of God. Uh, so that the Son of God will be received, be received, will receive glory from this. Yes. Twice, twice in this chapter, that's said. Thank you. I don't often imagine what it was like to be Lazarus, but let's think about him for a minute. So he's been dead four days now. He's really dead. All of a sudden he's up. I mean, John doesn't give us a perspective on this, but it's interesting to think about what he thinks. So he's told in verse 44, we read this. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. So he was very tightly wrapped, which would have been the custom. And so Jesus says to everybody around him, take off the grave clothes and let him go. So he can't do it himself. Yeah. What, what I find interesting is that Lazarus obviously didn't walk out of the tomb. He was sort of picked up bodily and just plopped right in front. I, mean, I don't see how else he could have got there. It was sort of like instantly he was presented you know, at the front of the, the tomb so everyone could see him. That, that was dramatic. Quite an entrance. Yeah. I also think, yeah. it, I think with the fact that 
there's been a stench coming out of the tomb he's been for four days. His body has probably already started to decompose. So not only did he get raised from the dead, I mean, he would have had to kind of be restored in terms of some of the physical part that had happened yeah. in those four days as well. Yeah. This and makes me think about the, the account of the cleansing of the lepers. So Jesus cured the lepers right on the spot. Mm. Only one turn around to thank him, right? Um, but here's a man who's decomposing, who presumably was, was healed, cleansed, restored right on the spot. Huh. It's similar to your reading this past Sunday of the Ezekiel. Ezekiel, Ezekiel saying, yes. Ezekiel with the bones. Yeah. In other words, put the flesh, the sinew back on. So obviously if you can raise them, I'm sure he fluffed and buffed them a little bit before he came out. I hate to use that word, but you know what I mean. <laughs> you get it, yes. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but... Uh, He's got that power. I'm sure he made him look presentable. <laughs> and he cleans up, cleans up well. <laughs> Something like that. I, I don't know. Both Ron and Bill look very comfortable in their chairs sitting there. I think Ron's going to I'm trying to, to figure out how to get mine to lean back, but yeah. it won't. <laughs> Do you want me to sit up more or what? <laughs> <laughs> what are you, what are you taking? You Ron, it's your, birth, it's your birthday, Ron. You can do whatever you want to do. Happy, happy birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> to go back to your question of why didn't Lazarus walk out, if he was bound so tightly head and foot, he wouldn't have been able to. So there would have had to have been some other method of transporting him out of the cave. It's interesting that the word translated says, let him go. You remember back in Exodus, when Moses told Pharaoh, let my people go? And the whole Passover promises were delivered out of bondage into freedom out of slavery into liberation. And so this is very much an image here that Jesus has delivered Lazarus from death to life. Let him go as the final sign that he's going to walk free. What do you think the significance is that Jesus asked the community surrounding Lazarus to do the work of taking off the, the grave clothes to let him go? Well, it gives credibility because if the people are doing it, and you know, I mean, the fact that they're, you know, it's like the fact that they're doing it and they seem that he has come back, it, it, um, I think it gives credibility. Yeah, exactly. Well, I, I guess the other thing to think about is ceremonially, uh, uh, Jews couldn't touch a dead body. Huh? Uh, so here's uh, a dead man raised again. You know, which side of that law does it fall? Is he still dead or is he now alive? And I'd be curious uh, as to who is willing to do that. Hmm. Interesting thought. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Move on to the plot to kill Jesus. Okay, George, will you read for us 45 to the end, please? Yes. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary had seen what Jesus did. They put their faith in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. What are they accomplishing? What are we accomplishing, they asked. Here is the man performing many miraculous signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and then the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. Then one of them, named Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, spoke up. You know nothing at all. 
you do not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than the whole nation perish. He did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation, and not only for that nation, but also for the scattered children of God, to bring them together and make them one. So from that day on, they plotted to take his life. Therefore, Jesus no longer moved about public, publicly among the Jews. Instead, he withdrew to a region near the desert to a village called Ephraim, where he stayed with his disciples. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, many went up from the country to Jerusalem for their ceremonial cleansing before the Passover. They kept looking for Jesus, and as they stood in the temple area, they asked one another, What do you think? Isn't he coming to the feast at all? But the chief priests and Pharisees had given orders that if anyone found out where Jesus was, he should report it so that they might arrest him. We have Jesus' seventh and final sign in John's Gospel. His public ministry in that regard is essentially concluded. And he's going to have to escape for a while before he'll come back in to prepare for the triumphal entry. But they're on. They are. I can see them behind that screen. Yeah. So the plot to kill Jesus is about what he did with Lazarus, right? But everything... What are some of the things that has riled up Jesus' opponents? And we remember? Well, the fact that he broke the law and did things on the Sabbath. Mm. They used that as an excuse. What he said about himself. I am. Absolutely. I am statements. I am the light of the world. I am the resurrection and the life. Before... Abraham was, I am, all those times that uh, he led them to, uh, his words led them to pick up stones to try to, to stone him. Right. I guess, I guess this is kind of the tipping point. Um, it's the last straw of, you know, accumulative evidence against him and, and the threat when they say if we don't get rid of this guy we're toast I mean the Romans are going to take over we'll have nothing left it's either him or us you know <clears throat> I think what's interesting about that if you look at um, uh, when it said Pike uh, said to them nothing all you, you do not understand it's better for you to have one man die than for the people of the whole nation destroyed in essence if you look what happened one man eventually died instead of destroying the nation he did exactly the opposite. Same. He became the sacrificial lamb. Right. Mm -hmm. Of course. The scapegoat. Yes. Were they concerned that um, that there was something of a revolution going on that might turn into a a war type of revolution against the Romans? And then, if, then, in fact, if Jesus can demonstrate his abilities through his miracles, he could um, accumulate enough Jewish people that they would rise up against the Romans. And the Pharisees wouldn't be involved in the command of those group of that group. I'm surprised yes. that they didn't give any thought in terms of realizing their actions were actually going to make him a martyr which would you know more or less yes. intensify everything yeah he's you think they would have said well we do take him with all of this that's going on this is going to put him in a higher beam once he's dead you know i mean that, that never came into account i don't think or it did do you remember the movie jesus christ superstar hmm. yeah yeah. I've seen there were Caiaphas in that incredibly deep bass voice um, 
to sing something about we must we're thinking of, I'm thinking of a more permanent solution to, I just always think of that that's his line. Yeah. 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 yeah what I thought was inter I thought was interesting in verse 51 where it says uh, Caiaphas uh, as a high priest he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation so if he pr truly prophesied, the spirit would have to be upon him and revealing the truth that he was the sacrifice. And maybe his interpretation of that prophecy was that it was for the good of the uh, Pharisees and the nation there, as opposed to the Messiah, the sacrificial uh, prophecy. Yeah. So he prophesied you know, that, the early, that year earlier that Jesus would die. Thank you for those insights. And notice the emphasis upon the temple. Why would the temple be such an important focus for the religious authorities? Apart from the obvious that that's where their center of worship was, remember from some of the things that Jesus did related to the temple before this, we learned some things about what was at stake. Can you remember some of those things? Remember we talked about the major money-making operation going on there? Yeah. It was a change in the culture of the temple on the Sabbath. So he turfed out all of the merchants and the money changers. Let's talk for a moment about the Sanhedrin. So verse 47 says, Then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. Do we know who they were? Wasn't it the council of the priests? Right. Yes, the ruling party, the aristocracy among the religious leaders, those who really called the shots, controlled the money. Were they a total of 70 members of that, or have I got it mixed up with something? That's a good question, Dan. I can't remember exactly. Someone might want to look that up while we're talking. That sounds right. Yeah, it is 70. So the and Jewish the high priest serves the seventy first to break any ties. Okay, thanks, Tom. And the Jewish nation was considered to be a theocracy. Right. Yep. Okay. Any other insights or comments on this? No, only that, that Caiaphas and company were getting very concerned that they were going to lose control. So that, that was why they, one of the reasons why they wanted to have Jesus, Jesus crucified. And I, I think when you look at this 52, not for the nation only, uh, I'm sorry. But I said, if you look at 52 and it says, not for the nation only, but to gather into one the dispersed children of God. And I think Clinton just said that, you know, if they were a theocracy, the, the thing that was really being prophesied also here maybe is the fact that the, when he said, you know, the temple will be destroyed in three days, will be built again, you know, that would happen, whatever. So I think that part of me might be referenced into here too.
what I find interesting too is that why haven't they, I, I assume the apostles are with them during this. I don't know if they're in the background somewhere in the village, whatever. Why did they zero? I mean, I know they're going to zero in on Jesus, but you think they would want to take all of it because they know he's obviously got followers that are really close to him. Why haven't they ever mentioned that we need to take the apostles with them <laughs> for killing? You know, I mean, because by killing him, they know that the, the followers of him will continue. So why not take the entire group? Anyway. Point. Lazarus yeah. is marked for death as the witness of what Jesus did. Yeah. Jesus is marked for death. And presumably his apostles or his disciples at this point are as well. But they're not quite the threat that they'll later be. Like in the book of Acts, we see that they're quite the threat mm -hmm. because they've been empowered through the infilling of the Holy Spirit. That they're focused entirely on Jesus and then Lazarus. I'd like to read part of Isaiah 53, the prophecy of the suffering servant, which we'll see in more detail as we get toward the crucifixion. But one part that really strikes me is, is this. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. As we think about Lazarus's grave, and then the prophecy is that he'll be assigned a grave with the wicked and in his death, that takes us back to the story of Joseph of Arimathea giving him his own grave, right? Verse 10, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. The Lord makes his life an offering for sin. He will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hands. So when we look at the words of the high priest, you know nothing at all. Um, you do not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. He did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation. And not only for that nation, but also for the scattered children of God. To bring them together and make them one. Let's talk more about that prophecy. What is that saying? Well, it's... It it's kind of how you would interpret it, right? Um, the Caiaphas saw it as a right to kill Jesus because it was prophesied and it's for the betterment of the people. Um, the prophecy probably was to tell uh, Caiaphas uh, and the people that he is the Messiah, the Son of God, and will die for your salvation. So it's kind of how interesting how Caiaphas took that information as justification to kill Jesus to save everyone else. And to save themselves more so than than uh, that. So, the pro I think the prophecy was meant for one thing, but was kind of interpreted and used by Caiaphas as another. David, do, are you saying he? had Isaiah 53 in mind, Caiaphas, when he said this? Uh, no, I was talking about uh, that prior that year, Caiaphas prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation. So uh, verse 52, 51. Yeah, yeah I wonder if, if he, he spoke unwittingly. He, I don't think he was prophesying in the sense that Thus saith the Lord, something will happen, predictive. I think he was, he made these statements and took these actions. And the writer of, you know, the Gospel of John, John and the disciple picked that up and interpreted it as, as a prophetic statement, even though it wasn't intended that way by Caiaphas. That, that's my guess. 
If I heard the reading from Isaiah correctly, I think the prophecy from Isaiah was that the death of one man would consolidate all the efforts of, I'm going to call it the next generation, because at that time, Isaiah didn't really talk about Christianity, but he did talk about a group of people, a nation, a culture coming together. So perhaps the prophecy was there already in Isaiah without any specific name. I, I agree. I agree. But I think that that uh, prophecy, uh, I think Caiaphas was uh, aware of that prophecy. Okay. Well, we'll see Isaiah 53 come into fulfillment in all kinds of ways toward the end of Jesus' life. Yeah. If we go to verse 54, we see a transition, don't we? Therefore, Jesus no longer moved about publicly among the people of Judea. Instead, he withdrew to a region near the wilderness to a village called Ephraim, where he stayed with his disciples. This village is probably one known as Ephron. E P H R O N, which is mentioned in Second Chronicles chapter thirteen, it's about twelve miles north of Jerusalem, so he's not that far away, and that's where he will remain before he comes back to the home of Mary and Martha and Lazarus, which we'll see as we look at the next chapter. We don't know how long he was there, but he clearly was waiting for his triumphal entry, and we don't have information about what exactly they did there, but I'm just imagining the celebration of them all together with Lazarus waiting for them back when he returns to Bethany. And that's 55. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, many went up from the country to Jerusalem for their ceremonial cleansing before the Passover. They kept looking for Jesus. And as they stood in the temple courts, they asked one another, what do you think? Is he coming to the festival at all? But the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that anyone who found out where Jesus was should report it so that they might arrest him. So remember before Jesus went to Judea to see Lazarus, Thomas had said, let us also go that we may die with him. So they already knew going back to Judea was his death. Now it's really intense. We're on the other side of the raising of Lazarus. So let's just look at that one more time. Why did this final sign of Jesus raising the dead create such fury? Why didn't it have the opposite effect? Which was to say, you know, we, we thought Jesus was a fraud, but anybody that can raise somebody that's been dead four days, now, now we have a different story here. We need to take another look at this, but we don't have any evidence of that, do we? Not yet. I, part of it is everything he had done to that point was contrary to what they were after. So he had cleared, the, you know, he had he had challenged the Sabbath laws. He, the things that he had done had not pointed to the power of the Sanhedrin, but it pointed to the glory of God. And that was sort of diametrically opposed to what the Sanhedrin was all about at the time. Yeah, and also he... He uh, back in you know in, in John John uh, two he had said you know if I destroy this temple in three days I will you know build it again and that was used at his trial as you know as as he was out to destroy the temple which was central to their life obviously so that I I guess all the cumulative he, he was seen as a major threat and they were so they were so convinced that he was going to destroy, that everything was interpreted in light of, of that. So it was a mindset, it was selective memory, it was selective, you know, they filtered information, they couldn't see this wonderful miracle as proving anything other than he was a threat. I think, I think also, also uh, 
the, the fact that the other two raisings of the, of the dead that Jesus did, it could be refuted that the people weren't really dead because the, the time hadn't passed, uh, like the four days with Lazarus. So this was truly a miracle that could not be refuted. And there were so many witnesses that this would give Jesus uh, credence that he was the Messiah, the Son of God. And I think that that's probably one of the major reasons that they were set to kill him. The other um, examples where they were trying to stone him or were furious because he broke the Sabbath were all instances of um, his Jesus breaking what the Sanhedrin, I mean, the Pharisees or the Sadducees saw as the law. Um, this is an example, according to um, the words of the high priest, of fear of the Romans. Um, if people believe in him, there'll be a movement and the Romans will come down on us. So there's a difference here. There's a, a, an awareness that things are at another level, that this is now a movement because of what he's done. I think the timing's kind of interesting too. I mean, you know, it, it's hard to say, but you kind of get the sense that this might be a couple of weeks before the Passover. And uh, so you're, they're kind of coming into a really kind of a prominent part of the Jewish uh, festival type of things. And to start doing, to create some, I'd say, excitement, if you will, or whatever, a couple of weeks going there where a lot of people are going to be congregating in Jerusalem, it just seems like the, the timing, I guess, couldn't have been better or worse or whatever from your, your standpoint. You know, as opposed to doing some type of year where when there's not much going on, it, he's kind of doing it and things are kind of building up and for kind of a normal festival in, in uh, Jerusalem anyways. Could it also be that uh, the Sanhedrin was very politically astute? They obviously could read the people and every time one of these miracles uh, continued to build, raising someone from the dead, their statement is, if we let him go on like this, everyone would believe in him, as Jim has said, that he's the Messiah. So some of them might have started to believe that he's more than just a prophet. Um, so if we don't stop him now, we're going to lose control. They're going to lose control as the politicians. Yeah. Okay. How sad that those in a position of spiritual authority over their nation were so focused on what was happening on the earth and so unaware of what God was doing. I mean, it's easy to look back and criticize because I wasn't there with them, but uh, it's just th th that there were more concerned about what the Romans might do and that they might lose their position of power and their earthly comfort. Um, it's... Yeah, I think we have some of that in our day time, our day now. <laughs> in, in different you think so? We do. I think, so. <laughs> I, think I think it's yeah. important. Um, I think for us to reflect on ourselves and what is it in ourselves that refuse to allow Christ to be crowned as King, if you will, or Lord over our lives, because I think. That's that's the the bigger story in, in all of this is not just looking at the political situation, but you know spiritually what goes on in our own lives that we all struggle with um, that come from the same roots, if you will, within us, um, the same roots of our uncertainties and our frailties, our our wanting to hold our place, if you will. Um, and I, 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 th I think there's, there's the bigger story that I think we all have to struggle with. Yeah, yeah I agree yeah. with you. Yeah. Yeah. I'll throw out an interesting comparison for you. In Jesus' country, the God was above the theocracy. In the Roman community, the Romans created their own gods to do what they wanted to do. Um, in that comparison, I wonder if that reflects on the Sanhedrin 
on the amount of control, if that's the word, that they have, or influence, that they have over the populace of Jerusalem, as opposed to the Romans. No I'm also sure that uh, John wants to show the passion of Christ. And don't forget that Jesus has just performed the greatest miracle in the history of the world. And what is the response of his own Jewish leaders, of his own faith, his own religion that he created? Their response is they want to kill him. Mm -hmm. And this is what John is trying to emphasize, the suffering, the incredible suffering. That he just did this incredible miracle of passion and love tenderness weeping <laughs> and these people want to kill him and it's it's very important yeah. not just about his suffering but also about what happened afterwards jay since you raised that pontius pilate said he could find nothing to find jesus guilty of and washed his hands of great insights. Jay, one of the things that you've said, I, I remember, well, and I really like it that the Bible is a, a book that celebrates life. And uh, here we have the greatest miracle of life, bringing life out of death in resurrection. Um, and in contrast to that, the authorities simply want to bring death. Um, this miracle of life makes them want to kill. Hmm. A month or so ago, we talked about the incredible rejection that Jesus experienced, which John highlights for us throughout the gospel, starting with the prologue where it talks about the fact that he came to his own people and his own people received him not. So this is the ultimate rejection, isn't it? to yeah. simply follow up on what you guys are saying. Here Jesus has wept, he's empathized, he's been with the grieving, and then he raises the dead with this incredible example of how he prays, calling out to his father, Father, I know you hear me, and this is for them. I mean, such love, such power. And the Jews around him come to believe, and that's the ultimate threat, isn't it? So that this will be the ultimate rejection having done a miracle no one's ever seen. Even in the Old Testament, there are a few examples, very rare, but a few examples like Elijah, where someone was raised from the dead. But nothing like this, ever. And so their response is to kill him. And they really want to kill him. And we know this because John tells us that they're asking, well, is he coming or not? Be ready, let's lay this trap for him. And so I wonder what it was like for him in this town of or Ephron, whatever it truly was, as he's waiting, he knows he's coming back to die. There's no doubt that that's going to happen. And in his full humanity, this son of God, who not only weeps and feels greatly disturbed, but who also is a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, as Isaiah 53 tells us, I imagine he must have been feeling a lot of emotions while he was 12 miles north of Jerusalem, just waiting to come back. In. And I don't think there were all good emotions. I would just like to thank, comment, thank you, Father Joe, that's fantastic. I'd like to comment on what Father Jim said. Um, what I believe is that Jesus was all about life. He saw the law as a means to life. He saw love as a means to life, but these guys who were opposed to him were all about death. They're all about law and judgment. They did not understand what the law really meant. And that is also part of his sorrow. He came to try to enlighten them, and he was rejected. Thank you, Jay. You know, you kind of wonder what the... What the uh, Caiaphas and the 
you wonder what they thought the end game was. I mean, you know, here Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. They're trying to go after him and kill him. And if he can raise Lazarus from the dead, you would almost think, you know, what, what, what was going to be, you know, if, if he could raise Lazarus, would the end game, once they killed Jesus, that was going to be the end of it? You just wonder what they thought the end game was. I think they thought that by killing him, they would they would have the the um, faith and the trust of the Jewish people back again, and um, it was very cynical, uh, um, very cynical uh, political decision that Caiaphas was uh, expounding on. There had been messianic movements before Jesus that were all crushed. Hmm. So we'll see later that a member of the Sanhedrin named Gamaliel will say, this is not of God. Like all the others, it won't succeed. But if it is, then will. And we know the story how it goes. So given the fact that there were messiahs before that tried to lead rebellions and were all crushed, the mindset, Ron, and answer your question, the end game was probably if we kill him, this will all just go away. And if it doesn't, then he is the followers too. Right? Yeah. Yeah, then and as we know from our story, they did kill him, so they succeeded in that, but God had a different plan. Right. <laughs> yeah, they, they thought it would be business as usual, you know, restore things the way they ought to be with gain control. We, we know what's predictable. We can deal with it, and, but it didn't end that way, obviously, you know. Yeah. Hallelujah. Thank God. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Yeah, it's Lent. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Even though it's Lent. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're going to stay with chapter 11 for the night. We won't get into 12 until next week. So everybody that's assigned to read for 12, please be prepared next week. And let's finish up our remaining time by wrapping up what we've heard throughout all these weeks together and, and sort of where we are with Jesus. You're, you're offering wonderful insights. If we could just build on those as we wrap up our time. What are some other thoughts or questions or insights that you'd like to share? I, I think one thing is just to me, in the whole thing of the Lazarus story with the whole weeping part, the thing that's interesting to me about that was about that whole thing, Martha, Mary, and none of them ever asked Jesus to bring Lazarus from the dead. You know what I mean? It wasn't like they requested it or wanted him. It almost like he just, um, I mean, he kind of had empathy with them with the weeping, and he was kind of driven from, from himself, not from trying to answer a request. And I think that's significant. Don't you think he wanted to demonstrate because both Martha and Mary had said, Lord, if you were here, Lazarus wouldn't have died. Right. Yeah. But Jesus, the, Jesus was insistent that it was going to be the glory to God, not uh, anything else. Yes, I agree, but I think I think Jesus was reinforcing the glory of God by listening to the human responses, but then taking it further in time to what he needed, and that was more than three days. And he knew he was doing that right from the outset. Yep. And he wept. And when he was, his spirit was deeply moved, I had this amazing sense of Jesus' identification, not only with Lazarus' death, not only with Mary and Martha's pain at their brother's death, but with all of us, with our deaths, with our, our brokenness, with our hurt, with the whole world. Um, 
that deeply moved his spirit. Amen. It was in the Grapes of Wrath at um, the funeral. Of, I can't remember which funeral it was. It, it's a number of people died in that, that wonderful that book by Steinbeck. Um, but uh, the family uh, tried to come up with a passage. And maybe I'm remembering some of the book. I'm not sure. But they came up with that passage, Jesus wept, um, that seemed to sum up um, his identification with, with, with dying, but also with the whole injustice of that system, um, as it was in California with those, those uh, migrant workers. Uh, it, it's just it's such a powerful passage of Jesus' identification with the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm that the Greco Roman mindset was that the gods are not connected to our emotions, they're indifferent. They have to be appeased. Here, God in the flesh comes among us and weeps with us. Weeps with a man named Lazarus that we have no information about. You realize that if we look at all the Gospels, he only appears in John and we have no information about him. It's not like he's been walking with Jesus the whole time or we know things about him. I mean, we know a lot about the other disciples, Peter, we know about some of the other ones to a lesser extent, but we've never heard of Lazarus, except that it's part of this household that has entertained Jesus, but there's no information about his personality or what he brings to the table, which is so important because it means that for this one obscure character, Jesus is weeping over his death, and that says everything about how the Lord loves us, yeah. every one of us. Mm -hmm. I've got, I've got a question. Can yep. you hear me? Hello? Yes. yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Question. This is, you know, I'm just sitting here. I know Jesus knew the method by which he was going to die by crucifixion. I guess from the signs of, you know, the way he spread his arms out and stuff and he'd give innuendos as to what was going to come to people. I wonder, did he really know that this would be the pinnacle moment, this instance with Lazarus, is what was going to actually trigger this to happen? I mean, kind of wondering if he, you know, not that we would ever know, but uh, was this going to be the, the straw that's going to break the camel's back, shall we say, at this moment with Lazarus? You know, but he knew he, knew he was going to die. He knew the form, you know, form of which he was going to die, but, he, you know, he sort of, said to other people, and I don't think they really grasped what was going on. But, you know, could it have gone on to something else other than the Lazarus situation? I mean, what if the Pharisees had sort of sat back and just said, we're going to keep an eye on them, you know, we're close, but it didn't happen. You know, what would have been the next step for him to get to the finality of his existence on earth? I mean, speculation. I just, I just was thinking about it. Thanks for that question, Bill. What do you guys think? As as the Son of God, Jesus had to know. No, that's yeah. I was thinking of that too, but you know, just you know, he he doesn't give any inclination that that's what's going to be the. I mean, well, he he knows that he's dying. He makes statements about being laid down on the cross and stuff willingly, but he doesn't say how what's going to precipitate that moment. That's why I mean, it just, it's, you know, you know, it's folly thought. You gotta excuse me. I just, I just, no, thought these, this is what it's all about when we get together to study the Word of God. Yeah. We can ask questions. Yeah. yeah, just, um, I mean, what would have happened if this w didn't precipitate his execution? I mean, what would he have done or, you know, what <laughs> great, I mean, other than it's great to, you know, that he was, I mean, nobody can bring a dead person back. It's huge but would have been something more monumental that, you know, would have been earth shattering other than the death of raising somebody. I'm just curious. That's, Bill. That's, that's, okay. that's a good, good question, Bill. I, I, I think, I, I keep thinking earlier in John several times, he came to a crisis point and he says, but his time was not yet ready or his time wasn't fulfilled. So yeah. I think he had a general sense <coughs> Of, of knowing when 
when it was ready. Um, so, but I, I, I think as, as Father Joe pointed out, I sitting there a week or two before the end, it must have been emotionally heavy on his shoulder, not just only at the Garden of the Gethsemane. I think leading up to that, I can't imagine the sense of inner, inner distress and, and even perhaps tear, knowing what it was going to cost him to uh, give his life for us. Mm. I, I like what Jay said. It's, this really shows, this gospel shows the passion of Christ. Um, is what it, what it meant to him to give his life. And uh, that's, I'm very touched by that tonight. Yeah. Well, and another, another insight is uh, on verse 54, therefore Jesus no longer moved about publicly among the Jews. Instead, he withdrew. And initially, you think that he was afraid, he was hiding, his time wasn't yet uh, now, uh, so he moved away. Uh, but the other insight is he knew it was over. He knew, Bill, potentially that the raising of Lazarus was the last grand miracle. And from there, he knew the Sanhedrin would be looking to kill him. And that was the final step. So he goes away uh, because the time wasn't yet, but will be mm -hmm. soon. So I, I just have a sense that you know, Jesus had it all under control. He is following the will of God and he knew exactly what, when, and how. I agree, Dave. And he also knew it had to be Passover. Right. Yeah, yeah exactly right. Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's true. Passover. Yeah. Paschal Lamb. Yeah. What a wonderful study this has been, as always. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> here we are. 801. And uh, we'll wrap up with a word of prayer. I'd like to invite you all to offer up any prayers that you might have as we say. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this time together. Thank you that your word is truly alive because you are the living word among us. We lift up all our prayers and concerns to you now, Lord. Thank you. We pray, Lord God, for Brother Ray, Lord. We just pray that you would be with him, that your spirit would be upon him, that you'd bless him and Carol as they grow close to each other, Lord God, and continue to grow closer to you. We pray, Lord God, that you would control the pain and continue to allow, to see, allow Ray to see the light, knowing how, how precious you are and that gift that you had given us all. And we ask this in your precious name. Amen. Amen. And for all the people of the world who are now uh, contending with this scourge, uh, uh, we know that you are the light and the, you are the spirit and the life of all of us. I ask for prayers tonight for all of those who are under stress who because of this troubled situation that we're in yes. have lost their jobs and do not know where to go. I ask that the Lord give them direction and that they have peace in the fact that they're loved by God. For Father Joe in this very, very difficult time. We pray too, Father, for wisdom and, and discernment and clarity of, of direction from our leaders, both nationally and locally, that uh, wise and right decisions might be made. We pray that the resources needed for healthcare providers and doctors, nurses, mm -hmm where they're touching patients, we pray that those, those that equipment materials would be provided soon. Amen. And I pray for all those people who are on uh, the front lines of uh, dealing with this issue, uh, doctors and nurses and technicians and the military that's called up. Uh, everyone who's trying to uh, contain uh, the virus. Lord, I pray that we'll all do our own part. Uh, if there's no one to spread it to, the uh, virus has to die. I uh, pray, Lord, uh, that the uh, end is in sight. Thank you, Jesus, for your, your uh, um, going through this battle with us. We praise your holy name.
And so, Lord, may our prayers rise before you like incense and be brought to your heavenly throne through our only mediator and advocate, a great high priest, one who loves us with an everlasting love, Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. 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 Thanks, guys, so Thank much. Thanks. Can't wait till next Good Monday. See you all. Okay. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Bye -bye. Be careful. Good night. Need a ride? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs>